Would you like to join in or observe? Yes, yes excellent. <laughs> so what I've done, this is banana palm fibre basically. I let it dry out completely and then I soaked it again overnight in some water to make it soft. So you just need to get two pieces, tie them together at the top. Then it is simply a matter of holding them in your left hand and the one that's closest to you, you twist it twice towards yourself and then you place it over the back and then you repeat. So twice to yourself and then over the back. Over the back. Yep. Okay, I'm going to talk about art and also um, garden elements and connecting children with nature, which I think is really important these days. Okay, I work at Black Forest Primary School. Um, it's near the Adelaide CBD. It's quite a big school, 520 students, and the garden is 30 years old. Um, the fences have gradually moved out over the years and the gardens change depending on the teachers and the staff and the parents who have been there at the school at the time. Um, we've got a mixture of different beds. Um, it's a mixture of display beds as well as working beds. We've got succulents and cacti and we do a lot of propagating in pots. We've got a sand dune bed. Um, we've got a butterfly garden. We've got a bed that's just fowls for picking for the kids. Um, we've got a hothouse, small orchard and an outdoor classroom. An area is also specifically set up for nature play. That's the purpose of the area, it's just for play. Okay, so we, we don't do much cooking. Um, the focus is partly on food, which is great, but it's also on lots of other things. It's about biodiversity, but it's about all sorts of things. And that's why we haven't, and we probably won't go down the Stephanie Alexander path, because our garden program is much broader than that, and I don't want to go down the narrow focus. Um, okay. In the garden I use lots of signage, I think that's really important in a children's garden, um, ranging from just you know, painted signs on wood to the laminated ones that you can put in these, sorry. Okay, yeah, these are an example of the signs I was talking about before. Um, you get the little display stakes from a company called Nord Industries, which is in Melbourne, I just order them through the mail. They're fantastic, they last for years, you just laminate pieces of paper and slot them in, so you can reuse them again and again. Um, highly recommend them and you can fit quite a lot of writing on the signs so you can explain things like you know how many loaves of bread will that little plot of wheat make. Okay we also have a mud pit which is a really important area of the garden I find. Um, it's a great area to contain children in one area so you can put you know a quarter of the class in there while you pull out a kid one at a time and work one-on-one -on -one with them so they're having a fun time in the mud and it just sort of controls them from running amok in the garden um, the way i run garden lessons is that a whole class comes to the garden but I personally can't deal with 30 kids in a garden by myself, it's just complete havoc. So what I do is I divide a class into three different groups. The classroom teacher has to come um, and also at least one parent volunteer. So we have three groups, each with an adult leader and we rotate through three different activities and then we have playtime at the end. So the activities would be hands-on gardening with me, um, an activity with the teacher which for example, if the theme of the day was potatoes, it might be the life cycle of a potato. And then there'll be an art activity with the parent helpers. And with this one, for example, potato prints. But there's all sorts of activities that we can do. And it's, I find it really easy to find things that you know, link up together into, into themes quite well. Um, for the art activities, um, as I get the parent helpers to take them usually, they have to be easy to do, achievable, fun, creative and also cheap. Um, it's, it's wonderful doing things like mosaics in a garden, but again it takes a lot of time, the glue is expensive, um, things like that. You know, they're lovely to do, but it's also good to have cheap and easy projects as well. And I'm just going to run through a few that I've done with my students. Um, lots of mosaics, we've got a really good one happening out there, um, using seeds, uh, it can be Christmas decorations, that's just gluing seeds on cardboard, which works cheaply and easily. Um, other sorts of collages, just using leaves. Um, you can use templates to trace around to draw out the figures. That works really well. Um, kids love making crowns um, like this. It's just a piece of cardboard and you staple the leaves and flowers on and they can also draw a bit. 
Um, with the wristband, it's just a piece of cardboard wrapped around with double-sided sticky tape stuck to it. So they just pick the flowers and stick them on their wrist and there you have an, an instant bracelet which looks pretty cute. Obviously, um, you know, the five and six-year-olds like doing that. The older kids probably would be highly embarrassed, so we wouldn't do that. So I just, uh, you know, I tailor the activities to the age of the children. Um, weavings as well. Um, it can be as simple as weaving some leaves through a piece of cardboard like that, um, or to something a bit more tricky like that, using either dried or fresh leaves. That works well. And different sorts of mandalas, like we've got a wonderful one happening out there. Um, you can just use leaves and flowers. You can either just do it straight on the ground or we've done it on a plate of damp sand that sort of keeps everything down quite well. Um, you can float them in a bowl of water. If anyone's been to Bali, you've probably seen lots of these beautiful ones outside restaurants and places like that. They're just floating in water, looking lovely. Um, you can do it into mud, which the bottom two are. Uh, the kids love doing that. That's just a, a big pile of mud on top of a, a log and they've put all their flowers and things on it. The brown things are actually live caterpillars they've put inside the flowers as part of their mandala, which was rather cute at the time. Yeah. And lots of other things you can do with mud as well. Make sculptures for a pretty good time. Um, our garden is completely fenced, which I think which works really well for us. We do a lot of um, planting in pots. If we didn't have a fence, those pots would walk. So I'm quite happy that we've got a fence. But you know, fences can be pretty ugly. So one way of decorating them is using fabric, or you can use um, leaves, vines, anything like that to cover up the fences. Scarecrows in all shapes and forms. Um, rusty tin cans look pretty nice. Uh, kids love this activity. Um, using a hot glue gun and whatever seed pods you've got around, you can make all sorts of creatures. It's one of their favourite activities. Um, you could have a theme of native animals or it could be um, aliens or something like that, but the kids from whichever age, they, you know, from the five-year-olds to the 12-year-olds really enjoy that activity as well. And again, it doesn't cost much money. If you've got the glue guns, they cost about $10 each and the glue sticks aren't terribly expensive and the seed pods are for free again. Um, hot glue guns. Yeah. Yep. Yep, like there's one on the table there, those black ones. You can get them from Spotlight hardware stores, those sorts of things. <coughs> Some more examples. <laughs> yeah, they look quite cute. The Christmas ones are very successful. The wings on the little angel are just a piece of pasta, you know, the bow tie pasta. Oh, right. Again, that doesn't cost much. And little googly eyes and just a piece of um, cotton wool for the beard, for the Santa. So quite fun, quite easy, and you can achieve it in like a 20 minute, you know, time frame. Veggie people. Quite fun and easy. And wreaths of different kinds. Um, the ivy one here, I've just used a wire coat hanger um, upside down in the pot, sort of attached to the bottom. You just fill it with soil and then you can grow ivy up as a living wreath, which looks quite nice. You can put a ribbon around it and then you know, sell it at the school fete or take it home for Christmas or whatever like that. Um, and just using what we've got in the garden. We've got a lot of grapevines at our school, so we use the prunings to make wreaths and other things. Again, that's using a hot glue gun. Simple but effective. Bark paintings. And totem pots. We got given a whole lot of terracotta pots, which was lovely. Um, so basically we've just painted them and stuck them over a metal post and they're wonderful totem poles. And then at the end of the year we'll take it apart and pot up all the pots and the kids can take them home and we'll do a new lot next year. Um, I always grow wheat in the garden just to show them you know, how, does, how is bread made. So we always um, we grow the wheat and we harvest it and we grind it up and make this tiny little amount of flour and they're always horrified at how long it takes and how much, how much wheat it would take to you know, make a loaf of bread. But we also use it for art as well and that's just plaiting the wheat to make a little Christmas decoration. 
Um, yeah, pressing leaves and flowers, that's another cheap and easy activity to do. And making bookmarks like this, I'll pass some round that I've made. Basically, it's just using pressed flowers and leaves on a piece of cardboard and you just run it through a laminator. Yeah. And again, they could even be linked to a theme. So if the theme of the day was indigenous plants, they would all be you know, your native plants. You'd write the names next to them and you could even write something on the back. And again, that's something the children can use and, and remember, you know, these are our local indigenous plants. We do that with our black forest plants. Mm. Um, tin can people, that's another fun activity. And bottle tops, someone gave us a huge bucket of beer can tops, so I have to think of activities to use with them. You can hang them up high and put a little, um, candle inside them and they shine at night. They look really cute as well. Um, the technique for them when you're banging the holes is you need to put a, a log inside the can otherwise it all bends and buckles when you're hammering it. Either that or fill it up with water and put it in the freezer and have it frozen. That works also I've found. Um, yeah, I've made sort of a little octopus or spider you can see there. I haven't really got a very good picture of it. But we did a, a display garden at the Royal Show one year, which is what that was. Lots more activities. I'm sure everyone's done leaf prints and collages and things like that. These are just a few variations which I'll pass around as well. Just lots of different colour paint for one big leaf. Or instead of painting on the leaf and then just pressing it on, um, put the leaf actually on the cardboard and then paint over it so you get sort of the silhouette, which is quite pretty. That's another technique. Or during peak wattle season, we do lots of wattle paintings. That's just using a cotton bud or a stick with the yellow dots. And the stems I do with a piece of cardboard just on its side, dipped into the paint. Looks quite cool. Looks really nice if it's done on a black piece of cardboard or red or something like that. Looks particularly nice. So you can have a look at that one. Um, yeah, using natural dyes. I haven't done a lot of that, but there are a few people around that are quite you know, specialists using dyes to make for different things. That's another activity. Um, and leaf hammerings, which I'm going to demonstrate to you here. These are a bit of our specialty. This is basically just done by using a leaf and a piece of paper and a piece of fabric. It can be cotton or something like this, something fairly thin. And you just put the leaf underneath it like that and belt it with a mallet. That's all you do. <laughs> yeah. So you do it on the ground, which works best. And after a while you can see that the, the sap comes through and it makes a beautiful shape. Um, you have to be persistent, try different types of leaves. I guess the amount of water in the leaf depends on how successful it is. Got a few other examples here. Plants more successful than others. Yep, these ones that's wormwood, that one's a fern. Plants with serrated edges look the best, I've found. Obviously you wouldn't use a really succulent plant, it just it's a big mess. But again, that's a that's a learning experience for the kids, you know, which one will work, which one won't. Yep. So you can have a look at that. Yeah, and you can all have a go at the end of doing one of these if you like, because I've got some hammers and some fabric. Yeah. Um, autumn leaves look partic particularly good. This one's faded a bit, but using the red glory vine leaves or anything like that in autumn, they look spectacular. Can you fix it or is it, is it basically non Yeah. Um, to be honest, I haven't tried, but they last for about two years, looking quite good, and that's long enough for me. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so that's another fa fun activity and it's great for boys that love, you know, hammering. You can take out some of your aggression or whatever. It's a very noisy activity, but I think it's quite fun. Yep. Okay. Um, I'm going to talk about natural playscapes. 
Personally, I'm not a fan of the playgrounds, which are basically rubber softball and metal equipment and plastic. Like We've got a pretty good example of the one just out here. That doesn't do anything for me whatsoever. Um, personally, I'd rather give kids a few planks and bricks and some mud and some water and say, go for it. Um, that's a lot more creative than something which is fixed and already finished. Um, that pirate ship out there, it's a pirate ship. And I don't think kids would be able to think of it as anything different. So they'd probably have, you know, they'll play for, for quite a while on it, but if that's all they've got every day, just a pirate ship, they'll soon tire of it. Um, so with natural playscapes, that includes plants, the soil, sand, rocks, log sticks, wood chips, and places to hide. Um, paths to follow, dry creek beds, all that type of thing, water of course. This is in the mud pit at school. Um, yeah, they get quite creative. There's a lot of good engineering that sort of happens in the mud pit. And a lot of kids today, they spend so much time in front of a screen that I reckon they've sort of lost the ability um, to do unstructured play themselves. Um, they've lost that creativity, which is really sad because they're either in front of a screen or they're doing an organised activity. You know, they're at a sport or they're at a ballet lesson or something like that. They just don't have the time and they don't have the opportunity to interact with nature just in a casual way, like a lot of us might have done in our youth. So I think it's, you know, it's really important that school gardens address that. It's not just about growing food and it's not just about learning about your native plants, it's also learning about nature and really connecting with it by play. And I think that's particularly important for primary school kids. Um, loose parts are really important for kids in a natural playscape as well. Um, with the pirate ship over there, there's nothing, they can't really interact with it, they can't move it, it just sits there. But if they've got sticks and logs and water, pots and pans like this, hessian bricks, pipes, all that sort of thing, they have some they have a wonderful time. They can be really creative, use their imaginations. And I think that's really healthy for children. And they learn. I mean, you can see the kids here building the brick wall. Um, it started falling down after a while, so I sort of gave them a few suggestions about offsetting the bricks, and you know, it, it clicked after a while, and they made one that didn't fall down. They were using mud as the mortar. Mm. Um, other useful props. Paper bags, I go through hundreds and hundreds of paper bags because the kids love collecting things, whether it be you know, leaves or flowers or sometimes bugs, but I try and get them to return to the garden. Um, magnifying glasses are very useful as well. Containers with lids for catching bugs, so lots of plastic containers with lids. Um, just a simple card table I've got here for snail and caterpillar racing. You just draw a circle on it, a small one in the middle, you put all the bugs and things in the middle and then it's a race to the outside. They love doing that. Easy activity, good fun. With snails, you can actually paint the top of the snails so you can tell which one's which. Um, different colours, have a bit of a race. I've got lots of plastic animals and plastic insects that are just scattered around the garden as well. You move them around and they love exploring. And things like that. What do you use the animals for? It's just for play again, more creative play. Yeah. Yep. You can do a lot more with a plastic animal than you can with you know, an animal on a screen like that. You can actually touch it and move it and hide it in a bush or something like that. Um, chickens. Chickens are fantastic for kids. I take my chooks to work with me every day to the school. Um, I live right nearby. I just carry them under my arms. And they spend the school day underneath the fruit trees in the orchard there. And the kids come in and interact with them as well. Some kids have never you know, been near a chicken or touched one. You know, they're absolutely terrified, but by the time they've, I've finished with them at this school, they're all, you know, they know what chickens are like and they love them. Mm. Again, that's more interacting with nature. Um, my favourite plants for kids, nasturtium is my number one plant. <laughs> you can eat it, it looks beautiful, you can suck the end, you can put a drop of water on it and it looks like mercury, it's fascinating. We call them magic leaves. Mm. Kids love them. And they're easy to grow, of course. They just come up by themselves year after year. Cape gooseberry is another one. Easy to grow. I live in Adelaide, um, so it's more of a temperate plant, I think. They just love opening up the little capsule and finding the, the little gooseberry inside it. 
The swan plant, of course, for the monarch butterflies. It is a bit of a weed, so you've got to make sure the seeds don't blow away and go everywhere, but it's just fantastic watching the monarch caterpillars eat the leaves and do their beautiful cocoon and then come out again. They come to us. If you plant the plants, the caterpillars will come. Yep. Potatoes. Yep. Potatoes are essential in any kid's garden. Um, we just have a small bed dedicated to potatoes, but um, I'm also the potato fairy, so um, when, we, when the first class is harvested, those potatoes, I go to the green grocer and I buy a bag of brushed potatoes and I bury them <laughs> because, you know, there's only, only so many potatoes you can get out of one bed. And I want all the kids to experience it and I like success in a garden. We want kids to be satisfied, so if it means cheating slightly like that, just do it, I say. And it works, they don't know any different. The teachers don't even realise, the parent helpers don't realise, I just keep my mouth shut. <laughs> oh yes, there's another potato. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Yep, Jerusalem artichokes, they're fantastic plants related to the sunflower, beautiful tall flowers, and the lovely knobbly tuber that comes out of the ground. Again, another really easy plant to grow. Peppermint geranium. Every garden's got to have one of that. The smell and the feel was just wonderful. Honesty, beautiful seed pods again. Pretty flowers, self-seeds everywhere, easy to grow. Sunflowers and wheat, I think I've already gone over that. And just some other plants which I recommend for various reasons because of their, you know, their taste or their smell or their shape, all sorts of things. Bidgiwidgi, that's a little local native um, to Adelaide. I'm not sure if it grows elsewhere. It's related to the rose, a beautiful little ground clover. And I like it because it has a lovely seed pod, which is round and it's got little prickles on it, just like Velcro. So you can grab the little the seed pods and throw them and they will stick to your clothes. That's a fantastic lesson in seed dispersal. Okay, so you can talk about how they would be dispersed by kangaroos. Yep, those little seed pods would stick to the animal the animal would move on, drop them, and then you get another plant. So that's your <coughs> seed dispersal lesson there. Um, yeah. Beautiful, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Most of the food gets picked and eaten either on the spot, or I send it home with the kids, or it goes to the canteen. Okay. We. Um, the school funds me for only you know, two mornings a week really um, as a teacher's aide. We don't have the funding for a cooking teacher, we don't have the funding for extra ingredients, and we don't have the facilities, so, and I can't <coughs> see that changing in the near future. So unfortunately we don't, but you know, we can do a whole lot anyway. And the kids do come back you know, say, oh yes, we cooked that pumpkin, we had pumpkin soup last night, and that was great. So I can be satisfied with that. Yeah, we've got lots of fruit trees. And again, we just pick and eat on the spot, you know. Um, I haven't done that, but we could, yeah. So most lessons, um, there's something in the garden that we can eat. You know, at the moment it's broad beans. Yeah, yeah of course. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you're teacher's aid just the black forest? Correct, yep, yep. I've, I've had another job to help pay the bills, which I'm not doing right now, but yeah. Basically in South Australia, there's no funding for this sort of thing unless you go down the Stephanie Alexander path and mm. I'm not doing that. <laughs> yeah. So did you, did, um, I missed the beginning. Sure. Did you explain to you how it works in the school, how it works in the kids, and so it's one class at a time? Yep, one class at a time. It's always in the mornings. I always need a parent helper, so it's helpful if you do it first thing in the morning because often there's parents that stay for reading help mm -hmm. with little kids, so that works well. So after reading, the whole class comes down to the garden, we divide into the three groups and we do the three activities and we rotate through them, then we have playtime at the end. That works well for us. Yep. And the garden's also open for pay, play three times a week. So that's quite useful for follow-up because it is really hard to get the teachers and the kids to the garden because of the busy timetable. Yeah. Um, we've got a fantastic automatic irrigation system drippers and everything. Um, the kids do lots of watering when they're there, of course. I've got, you know, 20 watering cans. It's one of the main activities I love doing. School holidays? Yeah, school holidays, it's, it's the automatic watering system and me. Yep. 
luckily they've paid me for the past few Christmas holidays to keep an eye on things, which is great. Yeah. I live right next door, which is very convenient. Yes, yes. So it works well. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and if I walked out the door tomorrow, probably unless they found someone else as enthusiastic, it would kind of fall in a heap. Because really, um, there are, I mean, the teachers, they all love it. They think mm -hmm. the program's fantastic, as do the parents. But none of them really have much time yeah. to be fully involved. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The teachers love it that they can come to the garden. They know I've got it all organised. They have to walk in. I give them their lesson plan, and all they do is yeah. present it. So I make it really easy for them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I've just got a whole lot of lesson plans. Yeah. Um, reception, like five-year-olds to 12-year-olds, basically. Yep, yep. What are you doing with the older kids? No, it, yeah, oh, the skill level just increases, you know, we do slightly different things. Yep, um, we do more about, you know, seed dispersal or more complicated life cycles, all that sort of thing. It's, yeah, it's not hard. And it's really easy to link everything to the curriculum. I really don't stress much about that these days because it seems that whatever we do, you can just go back to the curriculum and it's in there. You know, you can link it to science, you can link it to English, maths, whatever. It really isn't a problem. Mm. Yeah, so it's quite easy to justify. We just need the government to agree <laughs> that it's worth it. Mm. Have you, yeah. do you mainly do companion planting? Like what do you do in terms of pest control and that kind of thing in the garden? Yep, um, it's very much a permaculture messy style of garden at the moment with me. It used to be long straight rows of vegetables, you know, 30 years ago, because um, they're a bit sort of pedantic and anal about that sort of thing. But kids don't really plant in straight lines, or none of the kids I know do. Um, so it's messy garden, um, a bit of this, this, a bit of that, um, a lot like, you know, the pictures of Leone schools and the pictures of the Wollongong schools, you know, it looks kind of similar to that. To that. Messy gardens, um, so pests aren't a huge problem. Yep. 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 We squirt things off with water. We've got 40 kids to pick off the caterpillars. Or yep. <laughs> and we, we like having caterpillars in our garden, they're good fun to play with, you know? Yeah. Just take them from the veggies. They turn into butterflies. <laughs> yeah. So we, we don't get upset by that. You know, a few holes in some fruit is not a problem. If the insects like the fruit, you know, the fruit are probably good for us. We've heard that again today. So. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, we do too. Yep. Yep. So that's good. Yeah. Is there somewhere where you get your ideas from? Is there any particular websites that you recommend? Um, not particularly. Um, from also, um, the California Garden Network has got some good stuff on their, web, their websites. Um, a lot of the art ideas I've just sort of generated myself just through trial and error yeah. as to which ones work, which ones don't. Um, yeah, I just I've grabbed bit, get bits and pieces from all over the place and just sort of developed my own own ideas over the time. Yeah. Hmm. Sorry? Yeah. Yeah. That's right. But, yeah. Who does your signs? Yeah, I'm just going to ask you. Why do you get them in Adelaide? The, the company, the plastic part. Yeah. It's called Norwood Industries. Just Google that. They're in Melbourne. Norwood. Norwood, N O R W O D. Norwood Industries. Um, they work out to about $2 a plastic label, but they last for years and years because you just replace the inserts. Yep, I think they're really useful. And they come in different sizes. You can get little ones and you can also get bigger ones. Yep. Are they metal? Like they're plastic. plastic. And they just yeah. Go into the ground. They call them display stakes. So yeah. don't look up plant labels because they're plant they're display yeah. stakes. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. They work really well. Yeah. We get lots of visitors through the garden, people from other schools and that sort of thing. That's why I think signage is really important. If I'm not there to explain things or the kids aren't there to explain things, you know, it's there in writing, they can see it. Yeah. The kids do read the signs and yeah, it does sink in. <laughs> Yeah.